Let's check the streams online. All right, we got live. Do we have audio? All right, let's check. Okay, um, then we got it. Final chapter of the book. Let's go. Chapter 23, Galois Theory. A classical problem of algebra is to find the solutions of a polynomial equation. The solution of the quadratic equation was known in antiquity. Italian mathematicians found general solutions to the general cubic and quartic equations in the 16th century. However, attempts to solve the general fifth degree or quintic polynomial were repulsed for the next 300 years. Certainly, equations like x to the fifth minus one equals zero, or x to the sixth minus x cubed minus six equals zero could be solved, but no solution like the quadratic formula was found for the general quintic. ax to the fifth plus bx4 plus cx cubed plus dx squared plus ex plus f was equal to zero. Finally, at the beginning of the 19th century, Ruffini and Abel both found quintics that could not be solved with any formula. It was Galois, who, however, who provided the full explanation by showing which polynomials could and could not be solved by formulas. He discovered the connections between groups and field extensions. Galois theory demonstrates the strong interdependence of group and field theory, and has had far-reaching implications beyond its original purpose. In this chapter, we will prove the fundamental theorem of Galois theory. This result will be used to establish the insolvability of the quintic and to prove the fundamental theorem of algebra. 23.1. Field Automorphisms Our first task is to establish a link between group theory and field theory by connecting automorphisms to field. So, proposition 23.1. The set of all automorphisms of a field F is a group under composition of functions. Proof. If sigma and tau are automorphisms of F, then so are sigma tau and sigma to the negative 1. The identity is certainly an automorphism. Hence, the set of all automorphisms of a field F is indeed a group. Proposition 23.2. Let E be a field extension of F. Then, the set of all automorphisms of E that fix F, character uh, element-wise, is a group. That is, the set of all automorphisms, sigma from E to E, such that sigma alpha is equal to alpha for all alpha and F is a group. Proof. We need only show that the set of automorphisms of E that fix F element-wise is a subgroup of the group of all automorphisms of E. Let sigma and tau be two automorphisms of E, such that sigma alpha is equal to alpha, and tau alpha is equal to alpha for all alpha and F. Then sigma tau alpha is equal to sigma alpha is equal to alpha, and sigma to the negative one of alpha is equal to alpha. Since the identity fixes every element of E, the set of all automorphisms of E that leave elements of F fixed is a subgroup of the entire group of automorphisms of E. Now. Let E be a field extension of F. We will denote the full group of automorphisms of E by auto, uh, aut E. We define the Galois group of E over F to be the group of automorphisms of E that fixes F element-wise. That is, G of E over F is equal to the sigma in automorphism of E, such that sigma alpha is equal to alpha for all alpha in F. So let's write this here. First, we have that E is a field extension of... Let me write that clean. So we have that gf of e over f is equal to the set of all sigma in automorphism of e such that if x is in f, if x is in f, sigma of x is equal to x. If f is a polynomial in f of f, uh, f of x, and e is the splitting field of f over f, then we define the Galois group of f to be g of e over f. Uh, example 22.3, or 23.3, my bad. Complex conjugation, defined by sigma, which sends a plus bi to a minus bi, is an automorphism, uh, automorphism of the complex numbers. Since sigma a is equal to sigma a plus zero i is equal to a minus zero i is equal to a, the automorphism defined by complex conjugation must be in um, the Galois group of c over r. Example 23.4. Consider the fields q as a subset of q adjo adjoining root 5 as a subs uh, subset of q adjoining root 3 adjoining root 5. Then for a and b in q adjoining root 5, a plus b root 3 is equal to a minus b root 3 is an automorphism of q root 3 root 5, leaving q root 5 fixed. Similarly, tau of a plus b root 5 is equal to a minus b root 5 
is an automorphism of q root 3 root 5, leaving q root 3 fixed. The automorphism mu equals sigma tau moves with root 3 and root 5. It will soon be clear that id, sigma, tau, and mu is the Galois group of q root 3 root 5 over q. The following table shows this group is isomorphic to z2 times z2. We may also regard the field q root 3 root 5 as a vector space over q that is basis 1 root 3 root 5 root 15. It is no coincidence that the order of the Galois group of q root 3 root 5 over q is equal to the order of q, um, the index of q and q adjoined root 3 root 5 is equal to 4. Proposition 23.5. Let E be a field extension of f and f be a polynomial in f of x. Then any automorphism in G of E over F defines a permutation of the roots of F of X that lie in E. Alright, so proof. Let F be equal to A0 plus A1X plus A2X squared all, to way, uh, all the way to plus AMX to the N. And suppose that A is an E is a zero of F. Then for sigma in G over uh, in sigma in G of E over F, then zero is equal to the sigma of zero is equal to sigma of F of A is equal to sigma of a0 plus a1 alpha plus a2 alpha squared plus all the way to a n alpha n is equal to a0 plus a1 sigma alpha plus a2 sigma alpha squared plus all the way to a n sigma alpha n. Therefore, sigma alpha is also a zero of f of x. Let E be an algebraic extension of a field f. Two elements alpha, beta, and E are said to be conjugate over f if they have the same minimal polynomial. For example, in the field q joined root 2, the element square root of 2 and negative square root of 2 are conjugate over q, since they are both roots of the irreducible polynomial x squared minus 2. A converse of the last proposition exists. The proof follows directly from lemma 21.32. So proposition 23.6. If alpha and beta are conjugate over f, there exists an isomorphism sigma of f alpha to f beta, such that sigma is the identity when restricted to f. Oh yeah, it literally does directly follow. Theorem 23.7. Let f be a polynomial in f of x, and suppose that E is the splitting field for f over f. If f has no repeated roots, then the order of g of E over f is equal to the index of f and E. Proof. We will use mathematical induction on the index of f and E. If f of E, uh, the index of f and E is equal to 1, then E is equal to f and there is nothing to show. If the index of f and E is greater than 1, let f of x be equal to p of x q of x, where p, uh, p of x is irreducible of degree d we may assume that d is greater than 1. Otherwise, f splits over f, and the index of f over e is equal to 1. Let a be a root of p of x. If, if psi, oh no, no, not psi, my bad. If phi of f alpha to e is any injective homomorphism, then uh, phi alpha is equal to b is a root of px, and phi from f a to f b is a field automorphism. Since f has no repeated roots, p has exactly d roots b, uh, beta and e, by Proposition 23.5, there are exactly d isomorphisms phi from f alpha to f beta i that fix f, one for each root beta 1 to beta d of p. Since e is a splitting field of f over f, um, it is also a splitting field over f a. Similarly, e is a splitting field of f over f beta. Since the index of f alpha in b uh, e is the same as the index of f in e over d, Induction shows that each of the isomorphisms v has exactly um, the index of f uh, in e over d extensions, psi of e to e, and we have constructed f um, the index of f over e isomorphisms that fix f. Finally, suppose that sigma is any automorphism fixing f, then sigma restricted to f of alpha is phi for some phi from f alpha to f beta. Alright, let me quick reread this. It has no repeated roots, which means that it gives us the maximum number which is why we're able to assume there are d of them. All right, it's a polynomial, it's a splitting field. Um, we have f is equal to p, or p of x is equal of degree d. Um, okay. Yeah, okay. Okay, that makes sense, that makes sense. Corollary 23.9. Let f be a finite field with finite extension e such that the index of f and e is equal to k then g of e over f is cyclic of order k. Proof. Let p be the characteristic of e and f uh, of e and f, and assume that the orders of e and f are p to the m and p to the n respectively. Then n times k is equal to m. We can also assume that e is the splitting field of x to the p to the m minus x over a subfield of order p. Therefore, 
E must be the splitting field of x to the p to the n minus x over f. Applying theorem 23.7, we find that the order of g of E over f is equal to k. To prove that the Gawa group of E over f is cyclic, we must find a generator for the Gawa group of E over f. Let sigma from E to E be defined by sigma of alpha is equal to alpha to the p to the n. We claim that sigma is the element in g of E over f that we are seeking. We first need to show that sigma is an automorphism in E. If alpha and beta are in E by the freshman's dream, oh my god, that's why we have the freshman's dream. Okay, that's wild. Um, sigma of alpha plus beta is equal to alpha plus beta to the p to the n is equal to alpha to the p to the n plus beta to the p to the n is equal to sigma alpha plus sigma beta. Also, it is easy to show that sigma alpha beta is equal to sigma alpha sigma beta. Since sigma is a non-zero homomorphism of fields, it must be injective. It must also be onto, since E is a finite field. We know that sigma must be in G of E over F, since F is the splitting field of X to the P to the M minus X over the base field of order P. This means that sigma leaves every element in F fixed. Finally, we must show that the order of sigma is K. By theorem 23.7, we know that sigma to the K alpha is equal to alpha to the P to the N K is equal to alpha to the P to the M is equal to alpha is the identity of G over F. However, sigma to the R cannot be the identity for one less than or equal to R less than K. Otherwise, x to the p to the nr uh, minus x would have p to the m roots, which is impossible. Oh boy, okay, that is, that is spicy. That is a heck of a technical lemma. Yeah, I'm already going to be telling that I'm probably going to be doing a rereading of this just for clarity of a lot of these technical details. Because this is like, everything is coming together in these. Example 23.10. We can now confirm that the Galois group of q root 3 root 5 over Q in example 23.4 is indeed isomorphic to Z2 cross C2. Certainly, the group H is equal to ID, sigma, tau, mu is a subgroup of G of Q root 3 root 5 over Q. However, H must be all of G Q root 3 root 5 over Q. Since the order of H is equal to the, uh, the index of Q of root 3 root 5 over Q is equal to the order of G of Q root 3 over root 3 root 5 over Q is equal to 4. Example 23.11. Let us compute the Galois group of f is equal to x to the fourth plus x to the q plus x squared plus x plus one over q. We know that f is irreducible by exercise 17.5.20 in chapter 17. Furthermore, uh, furthermore, since x minus one f is equal to x to the fifth minus one, we can use de Moivre's theorem to determine that the roots of f are omega to the i, where i is equal to one all the way to four, and omega is equal to cosine of two pi over five plus i sine two pi over five. Hence, the splitting field of f must be q of omega. We can find automorphism c sub i of q omega by sigma i omega is equal to omega to the i for i equals 1 to 4. It is easy to check that these are indeed distinct automorphisms in q um, in g of q omega over q. Since the order of q omega over q, um, the index of q omega in q is equal to the order of the Galois group of q omega over q is equal to 4, the sigma i's must be all of the Galois group of q omega over q. Therefore, g of q omega over q is isomorphic to z sub 4, since omega is a generator for the Galois group. Separable extensions. Many of the results that we have just proven depend on the fact that a polynomial f in f has no repeated roots in its splitting field. It is evident that we need to know exactly when a polynomial factors into distinct linear factors in its splitting field. Let e be the splitting field of a polynomial f in f. Suppose that f factors over e as f of x equals x minus uh, alpha 1 n1, x minus alpha 2 n2, all the way to x minus alpha r nr, also written as the product from i equals 1 to r of x minus alpha i n sub i. We define the multiplicity of a root a sub i of f to be ni. A root with multiplicity 1 is called a simple root. Recall that a polynomial f in f of x of degree n is separable if it has n distinct roots in its splitting field e. Equivalently, f is separable if it factors into distinct linear factors over e. An extension e of f is a separable extension of f if every element in e is the root of a separable polynomial in f of x. Also, recall that f is separable if and only if the greatest common divisor of f and f prime of x is equal to 1. Proposition 23.12 Let f be an irreducible polynomial over f. If the characteristic of f is 0, then f is separable. If the characteristic of f is p, and f of x is not equal to g of x to the p for some g of x in f, then f is also separable. Proof. First, assume that the characteristic of f is equal to 0. Since degree of f prime is due less than the degree of f, and f is irreducible, the only way the greatest common divisor of f and f prime is not equal to 1 is if f prime is a 0 polynomial. However, this is impossible in a field of characteristic 0. 
If the characteristic of f is equal to p, then f prime of x can be the zero polynomial if every coefficient of f prime of x is a multiple of p. This can only happen if we have a polynomial of the form f is equal to a naught plus a1x to the p plus a2x to the 2p plus all the way of plus a n x to the n p. Certainly, extensions of a field f of the form f alpha are some of the easiest to study and understand. Given an ex uh, a field extension e of f, the obvious question is to ask whether it is possible to find an element alpha in e such that e is equal to f alpha. In this case, we call alpha a primitive element. We already know that primitive elements exist for certain extensions. For example, q adjoin root 3 and root 5 is equal to q adjoin root 3 plus root 5, and q adjoin the cube root of 3, uh, the cube root of 5, uh, square root of 5i is equal to q adjoin the 6 root of 5i. Corollary 22.12 tells us that there exist primitive elements for any finite extension of a finite field. The next theorem tells us we can often find a primitive element. Theorem 23.13, the primitive element theorem. Let E be a finite separable extension of a field F. Then there exists an alpha in E such that E is equal to F alpha. Oh, so this is good. This is good. Proof. We already know that there is no problem if F is a finite field. Suppose that E is a finite extension of an infinite field. We will prove the result for f of alpha beta. The general case easily follows when we use mathematical induction. Let f and g be minimal polynomials of alpha and beta respectively. Let k be the field in which both f and g split. Suppose that f has zeros a equals a1 to a n in k, and g has zeros beta equals beta1 to beta, uh, beta m in, uh, in k. All of these zeros have multiplicity 1, since e is separable over f. Since f is infinite, we can always uh, we can find an alpha uh, a and f such that a is not equal to alpha i minus alpha over beta minus beta j for all i and j with j not equal to one. Therefore, alpha of beta minus beta j is not equal to alpha i minus alpha. Let gamma be equal to alpha plus alpha beta or plus a beta. Then gamma is equal to alpha a plus alpha alpha, alpha plus a beta is not equal to alpha i plus a to be, uh, a be, a beta j. Hence, gamma minus alpha beta j is not equal to a sub i for all i not uh, i and j with j not equal to 1. Define h to be in f of gamma x by h of x is equal to f of gamma minus a of x. Then h of beta is equal to f of alpha is equal to 0. However, h of beta j is not equal to 0 for j not equal to 1. Hence, h and g have a single common factor in f of gamma x, that is, the minimal polynomial of beta over f of gamma must be linear, since beta is the only uh, the only zero common to both g and h. So beta is an f of a gamma, and um, a is equal to gamma minus alpha beta is an f of gamma. Hence, f of alpha beta is equal to f of gamma. <sighs> okay, <laughs> Jesus Christ, that was a lot. Okay. 23.2, the fundamental theorem. The goal of this section is to prove the fundamental theorem of Galois theory. This theorem explains the connection between the subgroups of G of E over F and the intermediate fields between E and F. Proposition 23.14. Let sigma i for i and i be a collection of automorphisms of a field F. Then, F of sigma of i is equal to A of F is in such that sigma i alpha, sigma i um, a is equal to A for all sigma i. Okay. Wait, wait, let me read this carefully. Oh, it's a subfield of f. So what it is, it's the set of all automorphisms, the set of all elements that are fixed by the automorphisms. So proof. Let sigma i of a equal a and sigma i of b is equal to b. Then sigma i of a plus minus b is equal to sigma i a plus minus sigma i b is equal to a plus uh, minus b. And sigma i a b is equal to sigma i a, sigma i b is equal to a b. If a is not equal to zero, then sigma i a to the minus one is equal to sigma i a minus one is equal to a minus one. And finally, sigma i of zero is equal to zero, and sigma i is one is equal to one since sigma i is an automorphism. Corollary. Let f be a field and g be a subgroup of the automorphism group of f. Then, f sub g is equal to the set of all alpha and f, such that a sigma of alpha equals alpha for, um, for all sigma in g is a subfield of f. Okay, yeah. The subfield f of sigma i, um, i of f is called the fixed field of sigma i. The field fixed by a subgroup g of automorphism of f will be denoted by f of g. So let's write this down. So suppose we have some set g as a subset of the automorphisms 
the automorphisms of f. Then we write f of g is equal to the set such that it's a set of all a and f such that if we have any sigma i in g sigma i of alpha is equal to alpha the fixed field uh, fixed field fixed subgroup of log g will be the norm of g example 23.16 let sigma of q square root 3 root 5 to q root 3 root 5 be the automorphism that maps root 3 to minus root 3. Then q root 5 is the subfield of q root 3 root 5 left fixed by sigma. Proposition 23.17. Let e be a splitting field over um of uh, let e be a splitting field over f of a separable polynomial. Then e over g, uh, e sub g e root uh, e over f is equal to f. So it's basically saying. Um, if nothing else, the Galois um, automorphism is actually really easy, but um, we have uniquely defined, in a sense, the Galois group to leave only the field fixed left, like our base field fixed. Proof. Let G be equal to G of E over F. Clearly, F is a subset of E sub G is a subset of E. Also, E must be a splitting field of E sub G, and G of E over F is equal to G of E over E over G. Oh god. <laughs> By theorem 23.7, the order of g is equal to the index of e sub g e is equal to the index of f and e. Therefore, the index of e sub g in f is equal to 1, and consequently e sub g is equal to f. Oh my gosh. That's kind of that's kind of sick. A large number of mathematicians first learned Galois theory from Emil uh Emil Artin's monograph on the subject. This very clever proof of the following lemma is due to Arden. Lemma 23.18. Let G be a finite group of automorphisms of E, and let F be equal to E sub G. Then the or, uh, index of F in E um, is less than or equal to the order of G. So proof. Let G, the order of G, equal N. We must show that any set of N plus 1 elements, A1 to AN plus 1 in E, is linearly dependent over F. That is, we need to find elements A sub I in F, not all zero, such that a1 alpha 1 plus a2 alpha 2 uh, plus on and on 2 plus a n plus 1 alpha n plus 1 is equal to 0. Suppose that sigma 1 equals id. Sigma 2 um, all the way to sigma n are morphisms in G. The homogeneous system of linear equations um, has more unknowns than equations. Yes. So we have in this n equations and n plus 1 unknowns x, um, x sub i. From linear algebra, we know that the system has a non-trivial solution, say xi is equal to ai for i equals 1, 2 all the way to n plus 1. Since sigma 1 is the identity, the first equation translates to a1 alpha 1 plus a2 alpha 2 plus on and on 2 plus a n plus 1 alpha n plus 1 equals 0. The problem is that some ai's may be in e but not in f. We must show that this is impossible. Suppose that at least one of the a sub i's is in e but not in f. By rearranging this a sub i's, we may assume that a sub 1 is non-zero. Since any non-zero multiple of a solution is also a solution, we can also assume that a sub 1 is equal to 1. Of all possible solutions fitting this description, we choose the one with the smallest number of non-zero terms. Again, by rearranging a sub 2 now to a sub n plus 1, if necessary, we can assume that a sub 2 is an e but not an f. Since f is a subfield of e that is fixed element-wise by g, there exists a sigma i in g such that sigma i a2 is not equal to a2. Applying sigma dumb sigma i to each equation in the system, we end up with the same homogeneous system, since g is a group. Therefore, x1 is equal to sigma 1 a sub 1 is equal to 1, x2 is equal to sigma i a sub 2, x n plus 1 is equal to sigma i a n uh, sub n plus 1 is also a solution of the original system. We know that a linear combination of two solutions is, uh, of a homogeneous solution is also a solution. Consequently, x1 equals 1 minus 1 equals 0, x2 equals a2 minus sigma i a2, all the way to a, uh, x sub n plus 1 is equal to a sub n plus 1 minus a sub i a sub n, um, n plus 1. That must be another solution of the system. This is a non-trivial solution because a sub i or sigma i a sub 2 is not equal to a sub 2 and has fewer non-zero entries than our original solution. This is a contradiction since the number of non-zero solutions to our original solution was assumed to be minimal. We can therefore conclude that a sub 1 to a sub n plus 1 is an f. Oh my gosh, nice, okay. <clears throat> Let E be an algebraic extension of f. If every irreducible polynomial in f of x with the root in E has all of its roots in E, then E is called a normal extension of f. Wait, let me reread that. 
So if every irreducible polynomial with a root in e has all of its root in e, then it's called a normal extension of f. That is, every irreducible polynomial in f containing a root in e is a product of linear factors in e. So theorem 23.19, let e be a field extension of f, and the following statements are equivalent. 1. e is a finite, normal, separable extension of f. 2. e is a splitting field over f of a separable polynomial. 3. F is equal to E sub G for some finite group G of the automorphisms of F of E. Proof. 1 implies 2. So if E is a finite normal separable extension, we want to show that E is a splitting field over, a pol of, over F of a separable polynomial. Let E be a finite normal separable extension of F. By the primitive element theorem, we can find an, a, uh, an alpha in E such that E is equal to F of alpha. Let F of X be the minimal polynomial of alpha over E. The field E must contain all the roots of F, since it is normal extension F. Hence, E is a splitting field for F of X. Slick. So now we want to show that if E is a splitting field over F of a separable polynomial, then F is equal to E sub G for some finite group G of automorphisms of E. So let E be the splitting field over F of separable polynomial. By Proposition 23.17, E sub G of E of so over F is equal to F. Since the order of g of e over f is equal to the index of f o um, in e, this is a finite group. Odd. Huh. Nice. Alright, 3 to 1. So if f is equal to e sub g for some finite group g of automorphisms, then e is a finite normal separable extension. So let f be equal to e sub g for some finite normal, uh, for some, not finite normal, for some finite group of automorphisms g of e. Since the order, uh, the index of f and e is less than or equal to the order of g, e is a finite extension of f. To show that e is a finite normal extension of f, let f be an, f be an irreducible monic polynomial that has a root alpha in e. We must show that f is the product of distinct linear factors in e. By Proposition 23.5, automorphisms in g permute the root of uh, the roots of f lying in e. Hence, if we let g act on alpha, we can obtain distinct roots alpha 1 equals alpha, alpha 2, all the way to alpha n in e. Let g be the product from i equals 1 to n of x minus alpha i. Then g is separable over f, and g alpha is equal to 0. Any automorphism sigma in g permutes the factors of g, since it permutes these roots. Hence, when sigma acts on g, it must fix the coefficients of g. Therefore, the coefficients of g must be in f. Since the degree of g is less than or equal to the degree of f, and f is the minimal polynomial of alpha, f is equal to g. Oh, that is, that is, that's so good. That is so good. Oh my god, I love this chapter. Corollary 23.20. Let k be a field extension of f, such that f is equal to k sub g, for some finite group of automorphisms g of k. Then g is equal to the Galois group of g of k over f. Proof. Since f is equal to k sub g, g is a subgroup of g of k over f. Hence, the order of f um, in k is less than or equal to the order of g, is less than or equal to the order of g of k over f, is equal to the index of f and k. It follows from g equals g of k over f, since they, um, since they must have the same order. Oh my god. Before we determine the exact correspondence between field extensions and automorphisms of field, let us return to a familiar example. Example 23.21. In example 23.4, we examine the automorphisms of q adjoin root 3, root 5, fix, and q. Figure 23.22 compares the lattice of field extensions of q with the lattice of subgroups of g of q, uh, q adjoined root 3, root 5 over q. The fundamental theorem of Galois theory tells us what the relationship is between the two lattices. Oh my gosh. Ah, ah, I'm, I, this is so good. Okay. We are now ready to state and prove the fundamental theorem of Galois theory. Theorem 23.23. Let f be a finite field of k or a field of characteristic 0. If e is a finite normal extension of f with Galois group g of e over f, then the following statements are true. 1. The map k maps to g of e over k is a bijection of subfields k of e containing f with the subgroups of g of e over f. 2. If f is a subset of k, a subfield of k is a subfield of e, then the order of uh, k and e is equal to the order of g of e over k, and the order of f and k is the um, index of g of, oh my gosh, that's a, that's why we have the index. Oh, is the index of g of e over f and g of e over k. 3. f is a subfield of k, is a subfield of l, is a subfield of e, if and only if the identity 
is a subset is a subset of g of e over l is a subset of g of e of k is a subset of g of e of uh, e over f four k is a normal uh, extension of f if and only if g of e over k is a normal subgroup of g of e over f in this case g of k over f is isomorphic to g of e over f um, over g of e over k it really oh my god it is really coming together oh my gosh this is wild okay proof one suppose that g of e over k is equal to g of e over l is equal to g both um k and l are fixed fields of g hence k is equal to l and the map defined by k which is mapped to g of e over k is one to one to show that the map is onto let g be a subgroup of g of e over f and k be a field fixed by g then f is a subfield of k is a subfield of e Consequently, E is a normal extension of K. Thus, G of E over K is equal to G, and the map K, which maps to G of E over K, is a bijection. 2. By theorem 23.7, the order of G of E over K is equal to the index of K and E. Therefore, the order of G of E over F is equal to the um, index of G of E over F and G of E over K times the index of G of E over K equals the index of f and e is equal to the index of k uh, and e times the index of f and k. Thus, the index of k and f is equal to the index uh, the index of g of e over f and g of e over k. The statement 3 is illustrated in figure 20, uh, 23.24. We leave the proof of this part of the property as an exercise. Ooh, okay, okay. Part 4. This part takes a little more work. Yeah, looks like it. Um, let k be a normal extension of f. If sigma is in g of e over f and tau is in g of e over k, we need to show that sigma negative 1 tau sigma is in g of e over k. That is, we need to show that sigma negative 1 tau sigma alpha is equal to alpha for all alpha in k. Suppose that f is the minimal polynomial of a over k, uh, over f. Then sigma alpha is also a root of fx lying in uh, k, since k is a normal extension of f. Hence, tau sigma alpha equals sigma alpha, or sigma negative 1 tau sigma alpha is equal to alpha. Conversely, let g of e over k be a normal subgroup of g of e over f. We need to show that f is equal to k of sub g of k over f. Let tau be in g of e over k. For all sigma in g of e over f, there exists a tau bar in g of e over k, such that tau sigma is equal to sigma tau bar. Consequently, for all alpha in k, tau sigma alpha is equal to sigma tau bar alpha is equal to sigma alpha. Become not because, my bad. Hence, sigma alpha must be in the fixed field of g of e over k. Let sigma bar be the restriction of sigma to k. Then sigma bar is an automorphism of k fixing f, since sigma of alpha is in, a, is in k for all um, alpha in k. Hence, sigma bar is in g of k over f. Next, we will show that the fixed field of g of k over f is f. Let beta be an element in k that is fixed by all automorphisms in g of k over f. In particular, sigma bar of beta is equal to beta for all sigma and g of e over f and therefore beta belongs to the fixed field f of g of e over f oh my gosh finally we must show that when k is a normal extension of f g of k over f is isomorphic to g of e over f over g of e over k for sigma in g of e over f let sigma k be the automorphism of k obtained by restricting sigma to k since k is a normal extension, the argument in the preceding paragraph shows that sigma sub k is in sigma of g of k over f. Consequently, we have a map sigma, or we have a map phi, from g of e over f to g of k over f, defined by sigma goes to sigma over k. This map is a group homomorphism, since sigma of sigma tau is equal to sigma tau k is equal to sigma k tau of k is equal to sigma phi of alpha, or phi of sigma phi of tau. The kernel of sigma, uh, the kernel, the kernel of phi is g of e over k by two. The index of g of e over f divided by the index of g of e over k is equal to the index of f and k is equal to the index of g over of g of k over f. Hence, the image of um, phi is g of k over f and phi is on to applying the first isomorphism theorem. We have g of k over f is isomorphic to g of e over f over g of e over k. That, oh my, that is that is seriously bringing everything back around together. That is insane. Oh my god. Oh my god, that is ridiculous. Oh my god, it's so good. All right, figure 23.24, subgroups of g of e over f and subfields v. Figure 23.25, in this example, we will illustrate the fundamental theorem of Galois theory by determining the lattice of subgroups of the Galois field of f equals x to the fourth minus two. 
we will compare this lattice to the lattice of field extensions of Q that are contained in the splitting field of x to the fourth minus 2. The splitting field of f is Q adjoined the fourth root of 2, i. To see this, notice that f factors as x squared plus square root of 2, x squared minus square root of 2. Hence, the roots of f are plus or minus the fourth root of 2, and plus or minus the fourth root of 2, i. We first adjoin the root fourth root of 2 to Q, and then adjoin the root i of x squared plus 1 to Q adjoined fourth root of 2. The splitting field of f is then q adjoined fourth root of 2i is equal to q adjoined fourth root of 2i. Since the index of uh, q adjoined the fourth root of 2i in uh, q is equal to 4, and i is not in q adjoined fourth root of 2, it must be the case that the index of q adjoined fourth root of 2i in the q adjoined fourth root of 2 is equal to 2. Hence, the uh, index of q adjoined fourth root of 2i in q is 8. The set 1 for fourth root of 2. 4th root of 2 squared, 4th root of 2 cubed, i, i 4th root of 2, i 4th root of 2 squared, and i 4th root of 2 cubed is a basis of q root 4th uh, root of 2, i over q. The lattice of field extensions of q is contained in q 4th root of 2, i, is illustrated in figure 23.26. The Gawa group of f must be of order 8. Let sigma be the automorphism defined by sigma of 4th root of i, 4th root of 2 is equal to i 4th root of 2, and sigma i is equal to i. And tau will be the automorphism defined by complex conjugation. That is, tau of i is equal to negative i. Then g has an element of order 4 and an element of order 2. It is easy to verify by direct computations that the elements of g are id, sigma, sigma squared, sigma cubed, tau, sigma tau, sigma squared tau, and sigma q tau, and that the relations tau squared equals id, sigma to the fourth equals id, and tau sigma tau is equal to sigma to the negative 1 are satisfied. Hence, g must be isomorphic to d sub 4. The lattice of subgroups of G is illustrated in figure 23.26. Oh my god. Oh my god. It's so good. It's so, so good. So we directly have, like, ah, oh, the, the bijection between the field extension. That is just, ah, oh, it's, mm. Historical note. Oh, by the way, if you think that, if you think this is over just because we're on the historical note, you don't know just how monumental Gawa theory is. Um... All right. Solutions for the cubic and quartic equations were discovered in the late 1500s. Attempts to find solutions for the quintic equations puzzled some of history's best mathematicians. In 1798, P. Ruffini submitted a paper that claimed no such solution could be found. However, the paper was not well received. In 1826, Niels Hendrik Abel finally offered the first correct proof that quintics are not always solvable by radicals. Abel inspired the work of Every Skawa. Born in 1811, Gawa began to display extraordinarily mathem uh, mathematical talent at the age of 14. He applied for the Ecole Polytechnique several times. However, he had great difficulty meeting the formal entrance requirements, and the examiners failed to recognize his mathematical genius. He was finally accepted at the Ecole Normale in 1829. I'm just going to also say while we're on this historical note about Gawa, uh, if you ever have the chance to look up Gawa's notes, they are bizarre. Um, I do not blame them for not recognizing his mathematical genius. Sometimes you can't even tell what he was writing. Galois worked to develop the theory of solvability for polynomials. In 1829, at the age of 17, Galois presented two papers on the solution of algebraic equations to the Academy de Sciences Paris. I'm not even going to try to pronounce that right. These papers were sent to Cauchy, who subsequently lost them. Nice. A third paper was submitted to Fourier, who died before he could, uh, before he could ever read the paper. Another paper was presented, but was not published until 1846. Gawad's democrat uh, democratic sympathies led him to the Revolution of 1830. He was expelled from school and sent to prison for his part in the turmoil. After his release in 1832, he was drawn into a duel possibly over a love affair. Certain that he would be killed, he spent the evening before his death outlining his work and his basic ideas for research in a long letter to his friend Xavier. He was indeed dead by the next day, at the age of 20. 23.3 Applications Solvability by Radicals Throughout this section, we shall assume that all fields have characteristics zero to ensure that irreducible polynomials do not have multiple roots. The immediate goal of this section is to determine when the roots of a polynomial f can be computed with a finite number of operations on the coefficients of f. The allowable operations are addition, subtraction, multiplication, division, and the extraction of nth roots. Certainly, the solution of the quadratic equation ax squared plus vx plus c equals zero illustrates this process that x is equal to negative b plus or minus the square root of b squared minus 4ac over 2i. The only one of these operations that might demand a larger field is taking of nth roots. We are led to the following definition. 
an extension field E of a field F is an extension by radicals if there exists a chain of subfields F equals F0 to F1 all the way to F sub R is equal to E, such that for I equals 1, 2 to R, we have F sub I is a simple extension of F sub I minus 1, and A sub I to the M minus I is an F to the I minus 1 for some positive integer N sub I. A polynomial F is solvable by radicals over F if the splitting field of K of F over F is contained in an extension of F by radicals. Our goal is to arrive at this criterion that will tell whether or not a polynomial f is solvable by radicals by examining the Galois group of f. The easiest polynomial to solve by radicals is one of the form of x to the n minus a. As we discussed in chapter 4, the roots of x to the n minus 1 are called the nth roots of unity. These roots are a finite subgroup of the splitting field of x to the n minus 1. By corollary 22.11, the nth roots of unity form a cyclic group. Any generator of this group is called a primitive nth root of unity. So example 23.27, the polynomial x to the n minus 1 is solvable by radicals over q. The roots of this polynomial are 1, omega, omega squared, all the way to omega n minus 1, where omega is equal to cosine of 2 pi over n plus i sine of 2 pi over n. The splitting field of x n minus 1 over q is q of omega. We shall prove that a polynomial is solvable by radicals if its Galois group is solvable, in the classic sense of solvability. Good refresher. Recall that a subnormal series of a group G is a finite sequence of subgroups G equals Hn, Hn minus 1, all the way to H1, H0 is equal to E, where H sub i is normal in H sub i plus 1. A group G is solvable if it has a subnormal series H sub i, such as that all the factor groups H sub i plus 1, H sub i are abelian. Yes, okay, abelian factor group. Yes, okay, let's come back. For example, if we examine the series ID as a subset of A3 as a subset of A3, S3, we see that S3 is solvable. On the other hand, S5 is not solvable by theorem 10.10, 10, uh, 11. A lemma 23.28. Let F be a field of characteristic 0, and E be the splitting field of X to the N minus alpha over F with alpha in, a, uh, in F. Then G of E over F is a solvable group. Proof. The roots of X to the N minus A are the nth root of A, the omega nth root of alpha of A, all the way to omega to the N minus 1 nth root of A, where omega is a primitive nth root of unity. Suppose that F contains all of its nth roots of unity. If, uh, if zeta is one of the roots of x to the n minus a, then distinct roots of x to the n minus a are zeta, omega zeta, all the way to omega n minus 1 zeta, and e is equal to f zeta. Since g of e over f permutes the roots x to the n minus alpha or minus a, the elements g of e over f must be determined by their action on these roots. Let sigma and tau, let, oh my gosh, my voice. Okay. Um, let sigma and tau be in g of e over f, and suppose that sigma of zeta is equal to wi zeta, and tau of zeta is equal to wj zeta. If f contains the roots of unity, then sigma tau zeta is equal to sigma of um, uh, omega i zeta, is equal to omega j um, sigma zeta, is equal to omega i plus j zeta, is equal to omega i um, tau zeta, is equal to tau omega i zeta, is equal to tau sigma um, zeta. Therefore, tau sigma is equal to sigma tau, and g of e over f is abelian, and g of e of o over f must be solvable. Now, suppose that f does not contain a primitive nth root of unity. Let omega be a generator of the cyclic group of the nth roots of unity. Let a be a zero of x to the n minus a. Since alpha and uh, omega alpha are both in the splitting field of x to the n minus a, omega is equal to omega alpha over, o, uh, over a is also an e. Let k be equal to f omega. Then, k, uh, then f is a subset of k is a subset of e. Since k is the splitting field of x to the n minus 1, k is a normal extension of f. Therefore, any automorphism of sigma in g of f omega over f is determined by sigma of omega. It must be the case that sigma of omega equals omega i for some integer i since all the zeros of x to the n minus 1 are powers of sigma, or are powers of omega. If tau of omega is equal to omega to the j is in g of f omega over f, then sigma tau of omega is equal to sigma of um, omega j is equal to sigma omega to the j, is equal to omega to the ij, is equal to tau of omega to the i, is equal to tau of omega to the i, is equal to tau uh, sigma omega. Therefore, g of f omega over f is abelian. By the fundamental theorem of Galois theory, the series id is a subset of g of e over <coughs> Oh gosh. My bad. Oh uh, man. The series id is a subset of g of e over f omega, is a subset of f, um, g of e over f is a normal series. By our previous argument, g of e over f omega is abelian. 
since g of e over f over g of e over f of omega is isomorphic to g of f omega over f is also abelian, g of e over f is solvable. Oh my god, that was the computation. Apparently it was such an amazing computation, my throat just like died in the middle of that. My bad, give me a second to drink some water. All right, lemma 23.29, let f be a field of characteristic zero, and let f equals f omega, subset of f1, all the way to f a sub r is equal to e, a radical extension of f. And then, there exists a normal radical extension, f is equal to k naught, all the way k sub r is equal to k, such that k contains e, and k sub i is a normal extension of k sub i minus one. Proof, since e is a radical extension of f, there exists a chain of subfields, f is equal to f naught, is a subfield of f1 all the way to f sub r is equal to e, such that for i equals 1, 2, all the way to r, we have f sub i is equal to f sub i minus 1, alpha i, and alpha i to the ni is in um, f of i minus 1 for some positive integer n sub i. We build a normal radical extension of f. f is equal to k naught as a subfield of k1 as a subfield of all the way to kr is equal to k, such that k is a superset of e. Define k sub 1 to be the splitting field of x to the n1 minus alpha 1 n1. The roots of this polynomial are alpha 1, alpha 1 omega, alpha 1 omega squared, all the way to alpha 1 omega to the n1 minus 1, where omega is a primitive n uh, one unit of uh, root of unity. If f contains all of its n1 roots of unity, then k1 is equal to f of alpha 1. On the other hand, suppose that f does not contain a primitive n one root of unity. If beta is a root of x to the n1 minus alpha 1 n1, also let me confirm what that actually is. That's I think that's what it is. Then all the roots of x in the n1 minus alpha n1, alpha 1 n1 must be beta, omega beta, all the way to omega n1 minus 1, where omega is a primitive n1 root of unity. In this case, k sub 1 is equal to f of omega beta. Thus, k1 is a normal radical extension of f containing f1. Continuing in this manner, we obtain f equals k0, k1 all the way to kr is equal to k, such that k sub i is a normal extension of k sub i minus 1, in case of i is a superset of i sub f of um, i for i equals 1, 2 to r. We will now prove the main theory about solvability by radicals. Okay, let f be an f of x, where characteristic of f is equal to 0. If f is solvable by radicals, then the Galois group of f over f is solvable. Proof. Since f is solvable by radicals, there exists an extension e of f by radicals, f is equal to f naught as a subfield of f1 all the way to fn by uh, is equal to e. By the previous lemma, lemma 23.29, we can assume that e is a splitting field f and f sub i is normal over f sub i minus 1. By the fundamental theorem of Galois theory, g of e over f sub i is a normal subgroup of g of e over s, uh, f sub i minus 1. Therefore, we have a subnormal series of subgroups of g of e over f. id is a sub, uh, subgroup of g of e over f sub n minus 1 all the way to subgroup of e of f of g of e over f1 is a subgroup of g of e over f. Again, by the fundamental theorem of Galois theory, we know that g of e over f sub i minus 1 over g of e over f sub i is isomorphic to f sub i over f sub i minus 1. By lemma 23.28, g of f i over f i minus 1 is solvable, hence g of e of f is also solvable. The converse of theorem 23.30 is true, also true. For a proof, see any of the references at the end of this chapter. Well, let's go. Insolvability of the quintic. We are now in the position to find a fifth degree polynomial that is not solvable by radicals. We merely need to find a polynomial whose Galois group is S sub 5. Begin by, uh, begin by proving a lemma. Lemma 23.31. If P is prime, then any subgroup of S sub P that contains a transposition and a cycle of length P must be all of S sub P. Proof. Let G be a subgroup of S sub P that contains a transposition sigma and a centau a cycle of length P. We may assume that sigma is equal to 1, 2. Then the orders of tau is p, and sigma to the n must be a cycle of length p for 1 less than or equal to n less than p. Therefore, we may assume that mu is equal to tau to the n is equal to 1, 2, i3 all the way to ip, or some n, where 1 is less than or equal to n is less than p. See exercise 5.4.13 in chapter 5. Noting that 1, 2 is equal to, um, no, 1, 2 times 1, 2, i3 to the ip is equal to 2, i3 to ip, and 2 i3 ip to the k, 1 2, 2 i3 um, times ip to the negative k is equal to 1 i to the k. We can obtain all the transposition of the form 1 n for 1 is less than or equal to n is less than p. 
However, these transpositions generate all transpositions in S sub P, since 1j, 1i, 1j is equal to ij. The transpositions as thus generate S sub P. Oh, let's go. Ah, oh, man, I'm getting hype. All right, example 23.33. We will show that f of x is equal to x to the fifth minus 6x cubed to minus 27x minus 3, and q of x is not solvable. We, cl uh, we claim that the Galois group of f over q is s sub 5. By Eisenstein's criterion, f is irreducible and therefore must be separable. The, der uh, the derivative of f is f prime is equal to 5x to the fourth minus 18x squared minus 27. Hence, setting f prime equals to zero and solving, we find that the only real roots of f prime are x is equal to plus minus the square root of six square root of six plus nine over five. Therefore, f can have at most one maximum and one minimum. It is easy to show that f changes signs between negative three and negative two, between negative two and zero, and once again between zero and four. Therefore, f has exactly three distinct real roots. The remaining two roots of f must be complex conjugates. Let k be the splitting field of f. Since f has five distinct roots in k, and every automorphism of k fixing q is determined by the way of remutes the roots of f, we know that g of k over q is a subgroup of s sub 5. Since f is irreducible, there is an element in uh, sigma of g of k over q, such that sigma a is equal to b for two roots a and b of f. The automorphism of c that takes a plus bi to a minus bi leaves the real roots fixed and interchanges one of the complex roots. Consequently, g of k over q contains the transposition. If a is one of the real roots of f, then q adjoint a of q is equal to 5 by exercise 21.5.28. Since q of a is a subfield of k, it must be the case that the index of q and k is divisible by 5. Since k, the index of q and k is the index of g uh, is the order of g of k over q, and g of k over q is a subgroup of s sub 5, we know that g of k over q contains a cycle of length 5. By lemma 23.31, s sub 5 is generated by transposition and an element of order 5. Therefore, g of k over q must be all of s sub 5. By theorem 10.11, s sub 5 is not solvable, and consequently, f cannot be solved by radicals. Holy... That was... Oh, okay. That's a lot. But that is beautiful. Okay. The fundamental theorem of algebra. It seems fitting that the last uh, theorem that we will state and prove is the fundamental theorem of algebra. This theorem was proven by Gauss in his doctoral thesis. Prior to Gauss's proof, mathematicians suspected that there might exist polynomials over the real and complex numbers having no solutions. The fundamental theorem of algebra states that every polynomial over the complex numbers factors into distinct linear factors. So theorem 23.34, the fundamental theorem of algebra. The field of complex numbers is uh, algebraically closed. That is, every polynomial in C of x has a root in C. So proof. Suppose that E is a proper finite field extension of the complex numbers. Since any finite extension of a field of characteristic 0 is a simple extension, there exists an alpha in E such that E equals C alpha, with alpha the root of an irreducible polynomial fx in C of x. The splitting field L of f is a finite normal separable extension of C that contains E. We must show that it is impossible for L to be a proper extension of C. Suppose that L is a proper extension of C. Since L is the splitting field of f of x squared plus 1 over r, L is its normal finite normal separable extension of r. Let k be the fixed field of a, um, let k be a fixed field of a C low 2 subgroup G of G of L over r. Then L is a superset of k, is a superset of r, and the order of G of L over k is equal to the index of k and L. Since the index of r and L is equal to the index of k and L, the index of r and k, we know that the index of r and k must be odd. Consequently, k is equal to r beta, with beta ha um, having a minimal polynomial f of odd degree. This will be very important. Therefore, k is equal to r. We know that um, g of l over r must be a two group. It follows that g of l over c is a two group. We have assumed that l is not equal to c. Therefore, the order of g of l over c is so greater than or equal to two. By the first c low theorem and the fundamental theorem of Galois theory, there exists a subgroup G of L over C of index 2 and a field E fixed element wise by G. Then, the index of C in E is equal to 2, and there exists an element gamma in E with minimal polynomial x squared plus bx plus c in C of x. The polynomial has roots negative b plus or minus the square root of 4b squared minus 4c uh, 4ic over 2a. Oh yeah, we assume it is 1. So negative b plus or minus the square root of b squared minus 4c over 2 that are in C. 
since b squared minus 4c is in c. This is impossible. Hence, l is equal to c. Oh my gosh. All of our proof was strictly algebraic. We were forced to rely on results from calculus. It is necessary to consume the completeness axiom from analysis to show that every polynomial of odd degree has a real root and that every positive real number has a square root. It seems that there is no possible way to avoid this difficulty and formulate a purely algebraic argument. It is somewhat amazing that there are several elegant proofs of the fundamental theorem of algebra that use complex analysis. It's kind of like a precursor to that. I will say this is probably one of the most complicated proofs of the fundamental theorem of uh, algebra. Um, every other proof that is like topologically based or complex analysis based is way easier. Like the complex analysis proofs are just clean. Um, it seems that there is no possible way to avoid this difficulty. Um, it's also interesting to note that we can obtain some proof of such an important theorem from two very different fields of mathematics. So, one, what is a Galois group of a field extension? It is the set of all automorphisms of that field extension that fix our initial base field. Two, when are two elements of a field extension conjugate? In other words, what is the definition? So they're conjugate. Oh gosh, my voice. Um, those two elements are conjugate if in the base field, basically we can write the element as an element in our base field plus our element in our extension field. And when that element in the extension field is negative, that's when it's conjugate. Summarize the nature and importance of the fundamental theorem of Galois theory. Capture the essence of this result without getting bogged down in too many details. Um, it basically allows us to determine a bijection. The most important part for me, at least, is that it allows us to determine a bijection between the structure of field extensions and the relative like subgroups of the Galois group. Um, and since the Galois group is something that can be easily like calculated, there's a lot of lemmas to put upper like bounds on it. It's something finite you can play with. While field extensions are extremely complicated, it allows us to convert between the like the world of groups and the world of fields in an extremely elegant way. Why are ensemble groups so named? Paraphrase the relevant theorem. Uh, paraphrasing the relevant theorem would be a good answer. Solvable groups are named solvable uh, because they correspond directly to um, field extensions that have roots solvable by radicals in the sense that you can um, have the answer in a form of a finite amount of nth degree like nth roots um, and otherwise they're not finitely solvable you have to do some other trick to get approximations for them so five argue uh, agree, uh, argue this following statement both pro and con uh, who which side wins the debate everything we have done in the entire course has been in preparation of this chapter um con the coding theory stuff pro everything that's not the coding theory stuff and the matrix stuff because ultimately we need to set up the theory of group uh ultimately we need to set up the theory of groups we need to set up the theory of fields and we need to set up the theory of rings properly um in order to properly describe we need rings to purely describe because we're not assuming that like our polynomials are for, like rational polynomials so we need the rings the groups are Gawa groups just that and the fields come from the actual fields and fields extensions so everything non-application based was building up in part to this chapter this chapter ne isn't necessarily required for everything else everything else has independent purposes see algebraic topology or differential geometry but like Gawa theory is the algebraic culmination of all this also I don't know if you oh Wow, nice. On Pi Day is the day that I actually finished this textbook. Oh my god. <laughs> oh, that's actually really, really funny. <laughs> um, I'm. You can probably hear from my voice, and like especially that insane cough that I hit earlier, um, that I'm not in the best of shape to be doing these exercises and to be reading and talking out loud a bunch. So I'm going to go rest my voice and celebrate with the fact that I'm done with this book. I'm done reading through this book for review, and I have the entire book documented in terms of reading which is insane i've done like 40 hours of reading over this this book nearly took two full days of reading worth over like a month and it's over and it's awesome and i'm gonna be happy about it and you can't stop me <laughs> but i guess yeah since i'm not gonna be doing these i'm gonna like put like slowly scroll down so that like they appear on screen a reasonable amount of the time.
and I'll also just have this right here because the Galois theory is like in um, the there, there's so much more you can do with Galois theory right like I know a lot of algebraic topology and like covering space theory pulls in facts like from Galois theory basically nearly word for word in order to prove certain results about like relations of the automorphism group um, and deck like and deck transformations automorphism group that's one nice thing deck transformations um, and certain field extensions and it's like extraordinarily useful um, so I will keep this here and I will say if like if you've read me if you've seen me read this whole chapter for a whole hour study this please go on your own this book is in the description it is free uploaded live for the authors I beg of you please such a beautiful subject do not leave it by the wayside by just watching some read through and not like actually doing a lot of this stuff on your own because there's so much cool stuff here that I can't go into because of my voice and just my disposition and my interest like ah ah oh gosh but I guess I'll stop I'll stop gushing and I'll just get straight I'll just get to my regular outro so one last song, one last time for this book thanks for tuning in have a nice death.